The next verse it says, but this is interesting to me, and, it, and Jesus, he reclines at the table in the house. He goes to Matthew's house, and he reclines. What does the recline mean? He relaxed. And this is an important word because when he walks into this house, what we need to see here is the fact that he wasn't uncomfortable going to someone's house that nobody, as we're going to see, that nobody would have ever gone to. But Jesus relaxes. He's not worried about anything. He's not worried about his life. He's not worried about what everybody else thinks. The only thing that he is doing is that he is relaxing. He reclines at the table. And then it says, Behold... Many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and disciples. So they were all relaxed together. So I, I want you to think about Jesus. He walks in there. They already know he's different. Usually when you have someone different in your home, you invited someone in for the first time. I, to be honest with you, I'm not always that comfortable. It's like, what am I going to talk about? What if I don't have anything in common with them? What if we have those moments of dead silence because what happens usually when we don't have someone to, something is dead? And we get all really, really uncomfortable and then you start sweating and then you start worrying about, uh, man, they're not going to ever want to come back again. They won't, oh, they'll never come to my church now. And you know, all those type of things kind of go through your head because we get uncomfortable. But that's not what this passage says. It says, and they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, they were comfortable with them. Almost like they were okay with it. But this is where we come in. Verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why, do your teach, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now what's interesting here is that they put both of the words in here, tax collectors and sinners. Why is that interesting? Well, because obviously, the tax collector apparently is worse than a sinner. Or we, they want to put emphasis on the fact that the Jews really thought that they were the, a big time sinner, right? So they put tax collector and sinner. He could have just easily just said sinners. And I think we could have got the picture. But they want us to see that this tax collector is worse than a sinner. Alright? He is the lowliest of the low. Okay? And he, and these Pharisees, exactly, and these Pharisees are like, why does your teacher eat with these guys? But when Jesus heard it, this is what he says. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Why is this important? Well, it's important because the Pharisees, and I was just talking with Al Therese, uh, I was telling a small group about this last night, it was like uh, the Lord just, uh, uh, it was definitely a thing that he provided. And Al and I got to spend some time together. He works for RBM Ministries, does release time classes, and he's been trying to get into federal schools to do release time class. Hasn't been able to, there's not a pastor in Fenville Town that will let him do release time class. They will not call him back. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was mad. Because I was the one that gave him the name of the pastors that I thought would call him back. Because those pastors have said directly right in front of me when we sat in a meeting, he's like, we are so excited about the fact you're getting into the school, that you're doing all these things that we've been praying about. We've been hoping for this. But you know what I came to the realization? Is that their traditions are more important than getting out of their comfort zone and getting into school and reaching people for Christ. They are too uncomfortable to get in the mix of something they don't even have to deal with. I said I would do all the work. I just need a building for those kids to get into. And they won't even open up their building because they're afraid those kids are going to make a mess. We have missed the point. I was like, of course, this would, he would have this conversation with me on Saturday. I'm going through Matthew chapter 9 and breaking down the traditions. It just got me that even much more worked up. And besides that, and besides that, Jesus is, is right here saying to them, those who are well 
no need of a physician. What he's saying is you Pharisees who, who basically are, think you have a relationship with me, I don't need to go to you because you don't think you need me. I'm going to go to the people I know need me. I'll be honest with you, uh, I failed in some ways in this area. What that means to me is I, as a pastor, and I was challenged this week through a book, and I was telling probably my Sunday school classes, I was challenged this week through my book that if I want you to start inviting people to church, I need to start inviting people to church. If I want to start inviting, and what I do is I invite those who I think will be comfortable. Instead of inviting those who, who need it more than anything else. And to be honest with you, uh, and I don't know why this is, it's probably because of the environment that I grew up with the church. I'll be honest, I grew up in a Pharisaic church, in a Pharisaic environment. It was about making people happy instead of about reaching people for Christ. And because of that, I, I, well, I struggled with it at times, where it's like, oh, I'm getting consumed by uh, people uh, being concerned about things that they don't need to be concerned about. And I need to focus on the mission at hand. The reason why it was a challenging week, the reason why all these things were happening, because Satan knew that 16 young people were going to come to know Jesus Christ, and he wanted to distract me, he wanted to distract everybody in our church, so that that wouldn't happen. He wanted to make it as impossible as he could. Because that's how Satan works. What's interesting, though, is that uh, Jesus goes on here. He says, go and learn what this means. He's like, just get out of here. You're just creating a problem. Go and learn what I'm trying to tell you here. It's, you already have it in your word. It's right here in my word. You just need to go and learn about it. Obviously, you don't get it. Just go. He says, go and learn what this means. He says, I desire what? Mercy. Not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, those who think that they already got it all together. I came to call the sinners. So let me ask you a question before we move on to the next part. Why in the world do you come? Why do you come to church? Why do you come to church? Do you come to church because of the music? Do you come to church because of the preaching? Do you come to church because of uh, your family's coming to church? Do you come to church because it makes you feel good about yourself? Or do you come to church because you want to get closer in your relationship with God so you can get out of your comfort zone and bring those who need to be here to church? Why do you come? next thing that uh, Matthew goes on to is, is another tradition that uh, was so uh, familiar with the Jews and the Israelites. First, they, they, didn't, they didn't socialize with sinners. They thought they were better than them. Then, there was, a, there was a tradition of fasting. And in verse 14, he says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus says to them, this is an amazing answer. He says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then they will fast. What is he saying? He's saying, guess what? The bridegroom is here right now. Who is the bridegroom? It's Jesus, isn't it? He says, the bridegroom is here right now. He's right here in your presence. There is no need to fast. There is no need to cry out because I'm right here serving right alongside you right now. And then he pretty much makes it pretty clear. So 
Do you mourn at weddings? Do you mourn at weddings? No. Well, you mourn if you didn't really want that person to get married, probably. Or if it was your girlfriend from the past that got married and you were hanging on hoping that she would, she would uh, come back or something like that. I gotta tell you a story. If you just came to me, my wife's gonna kill me. But uh, it, it fits right in with this. She had a boyfriend that did that. She, he would not be anybody until she finally married me. Then he finally started dating people. Because he knew she, he had a catch. He needed to, if she was gonna be available and then to come back, just like I knew I had a catch, he knew if there was any chance, I needed to wait as long as I possibly could. He waited a long time, too. I was just shocking, but I guarantee you he wasn't having a good time at our wedding. And in fact, he came to the wedding, so I guarantee he was not having a good time at our wedding. But for the most part, we have a good time at weddings, don't we? For some of you, probably too good of a time. We like to go and celebrate the reality of a life together in one. And nothing is greater than going to a wedding when you knew two couples love the Lord. Because not only are they one together, but they're one together with Christ. I got a family that is burnt on traditions. Right to the point of, and I'm sure Tom will you'll love this more than anything else, but I got a segment of families that can't even stand to watch a Michigan football game when they wear a different jersey than the original jersey. <laughs> Because they broke traditions. How dare they break tradition by wearing a different jersey? Even though the jersey probably looks a ton better. I get all excited. It's like, finally, they're making some changes. They're all like, I can't hardly watch the game. I can't hardly stand that they changed that jersey. <laughs> we get caught in these ideas of all these things that we like, don't we? They're just traditions. They make no difference whether those that team's going to win the... Obviously, Michigan's not going to win very many football games right now. It's not about the jersey. <laughs> but for some reason, we think all those little things within the traditions, that that's what's going to be the perfect setting for the church. I, but that's not the way it works. We've got to break away from those traditions. We've got to get excited about that wedding. But what's unfortunate is sometimes we have traditions where, where our mindset of what a good wedding will keep us from enjoying the wedding. Maybe there's alcohol there and you don't believe in drinking, so we're all mad because they got alcohol there. Or maybe there's dancing, which is usually the case when my family gets a little frustrated. There's dancing there. Man, they get mad at me when I go out there and dance with them. I enjoy that stuff. But the Bible doesn't tell me I can't. It was a tradition that was put in place to make us believe that that might be a sinful thing. But when we get to heaven, we are going to dance with the Lord. We're going to be dancing together. Just like we do when we have a great time at a wedding. I am so excited about that day that the Lord takes me home. I'm so excited when I get to spend time having this great welcome with my Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 22.2. 2. Turn over there just for a second. Matthew 22.2 2, it says. I'll, I'll read the verse, first verse as well. It says. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables saying. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. Who gave a wedding feast for his son. Isn't that amazing? The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. What does that mean? It means we're going to have a party. When we get to heaven, we're going to have a party. There are not going to be any more worries anymore because we're not going to care that someone came dressed in the, in the most inappropriate clothing because we're all going to be dressed alike. We're all going to be all overly excited because we're going to be spending eternity with, the, with our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross, who cared more about me than anything else, and I gave my life to Him. And because of that, I cannot wait to go to heaven and have that party. It's not just talked about there, but in Isaiah 25, 6, it says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for us for all people, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. What's that mean? 
Well, we won't go down that road. A rich food full of sorrow, <laughs> of aged wine well refined. What he's saying is that we're not only going to have a party, we're going to have a feast. Isn't that a great picture of heaven? Probably most of you can't even imagine it. I'm one of those, you know, I, there's these commercials. i got to tell you that 91.3 has got to take the Christmas music off right now. <laughs> Unbelievable. What are they thinking? And now 883 is going out, so now I, I'm going to have to go to 91.3 again and listen to Christian Christmas music. <laughs> Christian Christmas music. <laughs> yeah, I about blew that one. <laughs> The reality of life is, is that we need to understand what? At that moment in time, the bridegroom was present with them. They should have been celebrating. They should have been all getting on board and following him. Because the party was everything that he was doing in the lives of the people that needed him the most. Who? The sinners. bridegroom is with us. And then he says, fast. He says, fast after the bridegroom is gone. And basically he's saying, there's coming a time soon that I'm going to die on that cross. And I'm going to go back to be with my father. Then it's time to fast. Too many times I think uh, we we looked at the first part of the passage and think that means we don't need to fast. The reality is, Christians, we should be fasting. If there are struggles going on in your life and you're having a hard time making sense of it, I encourage you to fast. I've seen God do more things through the lives of people because of people fasting for them than in anything else. It is amazing the power of God when we let God use his power. And that's what fasting is all about. It's coming to the place of saying, God, you're in control. I cannot do this by myself. I need you. I need you to intervene in this area. And when he does that, it is amazing. He does <laughs> There's going to be a time of fast. Jesus explains why he's here. Then he moves on here. He says, No one puts on a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. My English is bad, but that English right there was pretty bad. I, I read that over and over. I had to ask my wife if I was reading it right because uh, it just did not make sense to me. But anyway, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into an old wine skin. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is filled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins and so both are preserved. So what do we need to understand of this? First of all, he's trying to explain to us that John, because we, they bring John the Baptist in here, is that John the Baptist was a reformer. His job specifically was to bring repentance among those steeped in tradition. He basically, his job was to go to all the Israelites and get as many on board and get them prepared for when Jesus Christ were to come so that the, the gospel message could go out. Because the Pharisees were so deep in tradition that they lost sight into what God was trying to do in the lives of the people. It became about their routines and what they wanted, their power, and what they could gain from it. So John the Baptist, his, his mission was to be the reformer. Jesus was not here to patch old systems is what he's saying. He was here to bring something new. Something new. John started the process. Jesus was here to bring something new. What was he here to bring? He was here to bring salvation for you and for me. He was here to heal the sick. He was here to cleanse the sinner. Righteousness is the thing that comes through Jesus. Not righteousness of laws and traditions. The 
righteousness of what he did on the cross. For you. I have to say this. Traditions, and this was a conversation I was having with Al, was so encouraging because he basically said everything that I was thinking all week long. Traditions is probably the biggest sin that is destroying the church today than anything else. Because we're caught fighting about the things we want instead of focusing on the things God wants. What God wants is you. Period. When you read God's word, do you read it so that, you know what, how does this apply to me? Or do you read it on, well, how's it bringing me closer to him? When you come to Sunday morning, are you focused on what you want out of the service? Or are you focused on how, how God is going to bring you to a closer relation to Him through what He's teaching us through His Word? I have to believe that that's where you're at because our Sunday, our, our Sunday school class this morning was huge. It means that there are people in here that want more. They don't care about all the other details. They just want to have a relationship with God. That's what that means to me. I can't tell you how excited I am because our church can't grow without people like that. Jesus was not here to pass the old system. He was here to bring something new. So in closing, I just want to ask these specific questions. I ask you questions every time. I, I want you to go home and talk about this. I want you to think about this. I want, to think how, I want you to think about how this applies to your life. But why are you hanging on to the past. There are some good things. One of the greatest traditions around is communion. And God commands us to con constantly do communion. There was, when I first became a pastor, I was like, man, we do communion a lot here. Most of the churches, we only do it a quarter of the time. You know what the reality is? We don't do it enough. After reading God's word, we probably should be doing communion all the time. That's one of those traditions that just isn't going to die until we go into that. There are good traditions. But we have to ask our traditions. Are our traditions founded on God's word? Or are they founded on our wants? Why are you hanging on the path? Why are you hanging on traditions? And then the last one. God has called us to something new. It's time to focus on reaching the lost. Not something I feel like I have to tell you guys. Because this church, I'm so excited, wants to reach people for Christ. If you didn't, the scholarship money that came in, all that kind of stuff that came in for Super Bowl would not have happened. It's because we have a church that wants to see people come to Christ. God has called us to something new. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have called us to something new. More with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Maybe there's someone in here that uh, just has been struggling with.